Section 11 of Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltovine de Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Perry. Where the White Rose Died from Selected Works, Letters, Sketches and Stories by Voltorine de Clare. It was late at night, a raw, rough-shouldering night that shoved men in corners as having no business in the street, and the few people in the northbound car drew themselves into themselves, radiating hedgehog quills of feeling at their neighbours. Presently there came in a curious figure, clothed in the drapery of its country's honour, the blue flannel flapping very much about its legs. I looked at its feet first, because they were so very small and girlish, and because the owner of them adjusted the flapping pants with the coquetry of a maiden switching her skirts. Then I glanced at the hands. They also were small and womanish, and constantly in motion. At last the face, expecting a fresh young boy's, not long away from some country village. It was the sunk, seamed face of a man of forty-five, seared with iron-grey eyebrows, but lit by twinkling young eyes, that gleamed at everything good-humouredly. The sailor's pancake, with its official lettering, was pushed rakishly down and forward, and looking at the hat and wearer, one instinctively turned milliner and decorated the shape with aigrettes and bows. They would nod so accordant with the flirting head. Presently the restless hands went up and gave the hat another tilt, went down and straightened the divided skirt, folded themselves an instant while the little feet began tattooing the car floor, and the scintillant eyes looked general invitation all round the car. No perceptible shrinkage of quills, however, so the eyes wandered over to their image in the plate glass, and directly the hat got another coquettish dip and the skirts another flirt and settle. The conductor came in, someone to talk to at last. Will you let me off at the ninth and race? The dim chill of a smile shivered over the other faces in the car. Ninth and race. Whoever heard a defender of his country's glory ask a conductor on a street car in Philadelphia for any other point than ninth and race? The conductor nodded appreciatively. Just come to the city, I suppose, he said interlocutively. The sailor plucked off his hat, exhibiting his label with childlike vanity. S.S. Alabama. Here for three days, just. Been over in New York. Like it, remarked the conductor prolonging his stay inside the car. The hat went on again proudly. Sixteen years in the service. Yes, sir. Sixteen years. The service is all right. The service is good enough for me. Live there. Expect to die there. Sixteen years. You won't forget to let me off at Ninth and Race? No. Going to see Chinatown? Sure. Chinatown's all right. Seen it in Hong Kong. Want to see it in Philadelphia. O oh, cradle of my country's freedom. These are your defenders. These to whom your chief delight is your stews and your brothels, your fantans and your opium dens, your sinks of filth and your cesspools of slime. Let them only be as they were, at Hong Kong, or worse, and the service asks no more. He will live in it and die in it, and it's good enough for him. Oh, not your old-time patriotic legends, nor the halls of the great rebel birth, nor the solemn silent bell that once proclaimed liberty throughout the land, nor the piteous relics of your dead wise men, nor any dream of your bright pure young days, when yet you were a fair green country townie, swims up in the vision of the service, when he sets his foot within your borders, filling him with devotion to old lady liberty, and drawing him to new world pilgrim shrines. Not these, oh no, not these, but your leper spot, your old world plague house, your breeding ground of pest begotten human vermin, so there is Chinatown, and electric glare enough upon it, and rat holes enough within it. The service is good enough for him. He will shoot to order in your defence till he dies. Rat tap tat went the little feet upon the floor, and the pancake got another rakish pull. Presently the active figure squared sharply about and faced the door. The car had stopped, and a drunken man was staggering in. The sailor caught him good-humouredly in his arms, swung him about, and seated him beside himself with a comforting, Now you're all right, sir. Sit right here, my friend. The drunkard had a sodden, stupid face, and bleary eyes from which the alcohol was oozing. In his shaking hand he held a bunch of delicate, half-opened roses. Hothouse roses, cream and pink. The odour of them drifted faintly through the car like a whiff of summer. Something like a sigh of relaxation exhaled from the hedgehogs, and a dozen commiserating eyes were fastened on the ill-fated flowers. So fragile, so sweet, so inoffensive, so wantonly sacrificed. The hot, unsteady, clutching hand had already burned the stems, and the pale, helpless faces of the roses drooped heavily. The drunkard, full of beery effervescence, cast a bubbling look over the car, and spying a young lady opposite, suddenly stood up and offered the bouquet to her. She stared resolutely through him, seeing and hearing nothing, 
not even the piteous child blossoms with their pleading down bent heads and with the confused muttering of no offence no offence you know the man sank back again as he did so the uncertain fingers released one stem and a cream white bloom went fluttering down like a butterfly with broken wings there it lay jolting back and forth on the dirty floor and no one dared to pick it up presently the drunkard sopped over comfortably on the sailor's shoulder who with a generally directed wink of bonhomie settled him easily bestowing a sympathetic pat upon the bloated cheek the conductor disturbed the situation by asking for his fare the drunkard stupidly rubbed his eyes and offered his flowers in place of the nickel again they were refused and after a fluctuant search in his pockets between intervals of nodding the dirty over-fingered bit of metal was produced accepted and the still dying blossom shivered in the torturer's hands he was drowsing off again when by some sudden turn of obstructed machinery in his skull his lids opened and he struggled up the image of myself must have swum suddenly across the momentarily acting eye nerve and with gurgling deference at the imminent risk of losing his equilibrium once more he proffered the bouquet to me grabbing the heads and presenting them stem end towards a smothered snuffle went round the car i wanted them oh how i wanted them my heart beat suffocatingly with the sense of baffled pity and rage and cowardice who was he that drunken sot with his smirching wabbling hand that i should fear to take the roses from him why must i grind my teeth and sit there helpless while these beautiful things were crushed and blasted and torn in living fragments i could take them home i could give them drink they would lift up their heads they would open wide for days they would make the room sweet and the pale soft glory of their inimitable petals would shine like a luminous promise across the winter nobody wanted them nobody cared this sodden beast in the flare-up of his consciousness wished to be quit of them why might i not take them something sharp bit and burned my eyelids as i glanced at the one on the floor the conductor had stepped on it and crushed it open and there lay the marvellous creamy leaves curled at their edges like kiss-seeking lips each with its glory greater than solomon's all fouled and ruined in the human reek and i dared not save the others miserable coward i forced my hands tighter in my pockets and turned my head away towards the outside night and the backward slipping street between me and it a dim reflection wavered the image of the thing that stood there before me and somewhere like a far-off dulled bell i heard the words and god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him the sailor no doubt with the kindly intention of relieving me from annoyance and not averse to play with anything made pretence of seizing the roses then the drunkard in an abandon of generosity began tearing off the blossoms by the heads scrutinizing and casting each away as unfit for the exalted service of his friend till the latter reaching out managed to get hold of a white one with a stem he trimmed its sheltering green carefully brought out a long black pin stuck it through the stalk and fastened the pale shining head against his dark blue blouse all the hedgehoggery smiled we had thrust the roses through with our forbidding quills what matter that a barbarian nail crucified this last one the drunkard slept again limply holding his scattering bunch of headless stems and torn foliage pink and cream the petals strewed the floor where was the loving hand that had nursed them to bloom in this hard unwanted weather loved and nursed and sold them ninth and race sang out the conductor the sailor sprang up with a merry grin bowed gaily to everyone twinkled his fingers in the air with a blithe ta-ta i'm off for chinatown as he slid through the door and was away in a trice tripping down to the pestiferous sink that was awaiting him somewhere and on his breast he wore the pallid flower that had offered its stainless beauty to me that i had loved but had not loved enough to save the rest were dead but that one somewhere down there in a den where even the gas-choked lights were leering like prostitutes eyes down there in that trough of swill and swine that pure still thing had yet to die end of where the white rose died recording by lucy perry in bath on february the twenty seventh two thousand and nine